effort to just be led by uh, my team to be led by the agencies. And one of the things we hadn't talked about publicly until last week was cost savings that came through that effort. Um, and we were pr very proud to announce that agencies on their own running the tech stat process, uh, we incubated it and then, and then deployed it across government, uh, drove a billion dollars in cost uh, implications across, uh, across government, with many of these uh, being the things we want to target, like eliminating duplication or uh, terminating or, or reducing scope of things that were out of scope um, and pulling that forward. Now, what's going to happen in 2012? As we think about going forward in 2012 uh, and sort of the themes of the, of the next year, um, there's going to be a focus really across sort of four major things. One is, one is, and many others, but these are sort of the four top ones. One is that continuation of looking at where do we get the investment capital to go invest back into IT, and that's looking at high ROI opportunities. The cloud uh, offers a lot of promise there, as we've talked about. Um, sharing across agencies, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, data center consolidation, and lots of other things kind of fall into this category. Modular development, which I'll talk about again in a second, is another big theme uh, we're going to look at in, in 2012, focusing on uh, 21st century government and productivity. And then, of course, cybersecurity um, are sort of the big four for us. As Mary mentioned, we uh, last week launched uh, FedRAMP. The new, uh, a new way for the federal government to not only save money, uh, importantly, on, uh, on procuring cloud-based uh, systems, uh, but also, a, 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 and most importantly, a new way that gives us a standardized apples-to-apples -apples comparison of security capabilities of cloud providers and those, those capabilities across, um, across that, the, the federal footprint. FedRAMP will give agencies a way to go in and sort of in a blanket purchase-like agreement, go in and buy cloud provider, cloud services, and then also know that when they buy them through the FedRAMP process, that they, were, they, are, they meet the security guidelines that we've, we've outlined. Uh, <clears throat> to do this traditionally, if we just didn't do FedRAMP, uh, agencies would have to go do this by themselves, one, and we would have about, uh, uh, about 30 to 40 percent higher cost uh, from just repeating the, the spend on procuring cloud, and uh, we'd have lots of variability in sort of the security footprint across this, this work. Uh, this is going to give us a very standardized way to, to secure cloud base with DHS, Department of Homeland Security, providing continuous monitoring across these systems um, and other things. Now, FedRAMP is in, in its infancy. You know, we just launched it, actually happening today as a workshop, an industry workshop on, uh, on some uh, third-party assessor work that has to happen to, to make, to stand FedRAMP up. And that's, uh, there's a workshop, GSA is hosting a workshop today on this. Um, and this is a great opportunity for you from an industry perspective to really help us and to get involved in, in making sure that as we crawl, walk, and then run through the FedRAMP process, um, that it is shaped in a way that, that is most beneficial to you is most secure and beneficial for the government and, and works seamlessly from all the, all the standpoints of trade and other things. We've got a lot to do and a lot to work on, and, but I think this, this will be the thing that, that lights, the, lights the fire under cloud computing in the federal government and gives us a way to really, really ignite this uh, phenomenon uh, all up. Another thing, and this is something we're actually launching, uh, releasing later today, um, I mentioned business and citizen interaction with government and how, how uh, uh, you know, we, we think about that. Uh, the, the, we have a, a joint team uh, with GSA's um, uh, citizen services team and my team have been working together on looking at uh, uh, .govs and thinking about you know, what are, the, what are the different aspects of, of our footprint from a citizen-facing perspective in the, in the .gov domain? So we did a, a, a few things. One is we ran an inventory across the federal government to think about um, uh, where, what's our .gov footprint and, and that, and we set some goals for ourselves to, to, uh, to sort of streamline that and get smart about, uh, about collecting data so we can make smarter decisions. Um, we asked agencies to submit web improvement plans, and those have come in, and you'll see in the report some of the information on that. Uh, a web governance study, uh, a survey and a national dialogue also happened. We had tons of people from the public actually give us feedback on all of this. From the .gov inventory standpoint, we ran this inventory from August to October, and we found about 1,500 uh, .gov domains. And what's, what's interesting, you start 
diving into this, uh, you can see that, that even in some case, we have lots of inactive .govs that actually exist, um, or there's a few that are site under, under development. A lot of redirects, which are probably OK. If someone makes a misspelling or you, you're off slightly, you can be redirected into a system. But I think this is an opportunity for us, not only to get smart about the way we consolidate websites in the federal government and direct citizens to the right resources they need, but also think about how do we, how do we save resources. You know, many times, many of these 1,500 systems are actually running on different platforms, and we're actually using computing resources to do that when they don't have to. We can actually pull them in to one effort. Um, there's interesting things happening kind of across our government. You know, at the, the Federal Communications Commission, we took forward a big effort to consolidate. I think we had about 12 different physical systems running the FCC website, and we sort of brought those down into just a, just a couple across kind of business, business and consumer um, and moved it to the cloud. Uh, but also things like the UK government uh, recently shifted to two websites across their footprint, a business one and a consumer one. Um, I don't know if that's right for the federal government, given our broader scope and much bigger size, but uh, we definitely want to get smart about this and think about how do we get citizens what they need when they need it in the best way. And um, I think there's a data strategy here and an app strategy and a, and not, and a web communication strategy as well. So we're working across all that. Uh, the other thing we're really proud of is this national dialogue we had on improving web, websites. We opened this up at the end of uh, September, um, and we had about 1,000 people uh, come get involved in giving us really meaningful, meaningful feedback on what we could do on improving um, our .gov footprint, uh, lots of comments and votes. We had a crowdsourcing platform that would give people the ability to, to give us this, this stuff. And you can see over on the right-hand side some of the key themes that came up in the dialogue were around customer service and accountability and ease of use and, and things that definitely, I think, off the top of your head, many of you would be able to say we need to do across the federal footprint. But this gives us a nice goalpost to think about how do we have those conversations with the owners of these .govs out there to streamline it. So you see at the bottom of the slide there is the, the, the site that uh, the report will be live on uh, later today. So I encourage you to go look at it. It's a long report. It takes you through kind of all the data and a lot of the things we've done um, going forward uh, from, from this stuff. And, we're making great strides uh, on this stuff. Whoops. So the last thing, last couple of things I'll talk about is um, something I announced in my in my park speech, an effort going forward. And this has really been from uh, you know sort of a, a thoughtful analysis of the of the state of things um, as I've looked at and had discussions with uh, with different people. And what, what's sort of fun, I, I, I've actually in this uh, in this uh, presentation for the first time sort of boiled it down to the most simple concepts, and that is that we need to, um, we need to move little things to big, and we need to move big things to little. Very easy, right? So let me talk about those for a second. And at, and at the park speech, I launched shared first and, and future first, as you see up there, and I'll talk about what those, what those things are. Um, on the shared first side, what we've tended to do as a government is, is uh, because of the way we're organized, from the the way missions and bureaus exist at the agencies connected to the way appropriators uh, and commi authorizing committees exist in the congressional side, what tends to happen when you draw a line between those two things, the people that give you money and the people that deploy the mission work of the agency, is that a lot of times the, the IT follows that same line. And what you see is in, in certain agencies, especially on the commodity computing side, uh, mission-level deployment of commodity resources. And so an example of that would be at the Department of Agriculture, you know, a year or so ago, across their footprint had 21 email systems, you know, across that entire, entire footprint. Um, the Department of Commerce had numerous PC buying contracts. Each bureau had a separate buying contract for buying computers. Um, you see this across hundreds of contracts and agencies for mobile deployment and mobile services. And you see this everywhere you go. You see on the commodity side, just, just diversity you know, uh, like crazy inside these places. And the motion of shared first and the, and the strategy that we launched last week really focuses on inside agencies on the commodity side. We need to move little to big. Take those 21 email systems. And, and move those to one. Take those you know, 18 or so PC buying contracts 
and consolidate those to a couple that give you the flexibility you need, and, but creates a buying phenomenon for you as an agency. And so focus on commodity. Now I know in sharing in the past and in the work that, that uh, you know, government IT is focused on relative to sharing tended to start on the complex side. They went, uh, they went after line of business and focused on payroll systems and HR and things that are, are really hard to consolidate. And there actually was really you know, big effort put forward and really good work happening there. Uh, to do lots of great consolidation. Uh, the approach we, we outlined last week and sort of our shared first uh, push was, again, a crawl, walk, and run scenario where crawling means let's focus inside your agency, let's focus on things that are at the commodity level that are easy to streamline, and let's go move to that. And in many cases, let's do those for, through cloud providers because you're going to have that sort of capex to opex motion and it'll be much more palatable and you're going to create a buying phenomenon for your, for your agency to be able to buy this, this stuff. And so, and so that motion is what we're inspiring. Now, walk and run will be let's start looking at opportunities. And I've called on agencies in that, uh, in that uh, strategy that was released last week to uh, ident start identifying the opportunity to share a couple of these commodity services and then by the end of 2012 let's move them let's let's go through the effort to go and move these small instances um, and I know this isn't just a CIO function I've met with the chief, chief acquisition officers council uh, chief financial officers council and others to talk about this this is a very much a cross-agency uh, very multidisciplinary uh, approach and something that we need to do this is one area where I think we have very much low-hanging fruit to go save a lot of money for the government and to take that money again in that cut and invest way and move it back in and then on the mission side where we develop solutions to meet needs uh, on the business side the motion there is move big to little I mean, if you were in, the agent, in an agency and, and sort of following the normal course of events in, in government and were tackling some big project, say, uh, you know, like an HR system for Department of Defense or something, uh, you know, the normal course of events would be go and spec out the, the project, sort of define, you know, a beginning and an end, which often is a multi-year type motion, uh, go get the money to spend on it, or at least a, a perception of what money you're going to get in year one, year two, year three, and year four, and then do a waterfall process where you start at the beginning and you work your way to the end. And what we see across government in so many cases is because of the variability of budget cycles, because of the variability of talent, because of the variability of technology, um, by the time you reach the end point, if you reach the end point, you're often, you've got a solution that costs more than you expected that took longer than you expected because your budget ebbs and flows across multiple years, that is oftentimes outdated, and, and many times laws that sort of govern the work you're doing change in such a fundamental way that you have to start over or you have to go in and, and modify. And oftentimes modify means you, you throw it all away and you begin, begin over again. And we have just example after example of these things across the federal footprint. And technology is, is here to answer the call. Um, technology now exists. Uh, and, and there are development uh, principles and, and guidelines that, that help us really move big to little. You know, using things like web services and machine readable data and, and, uh, and, and other uh, agile development approaches and things, we need to move these big missions into little components that deliver value on their own can be done in, say, 90 days or so, and can, and can be done, more importantly, within, a fisc in, within fiscal year constraints um, and deliver on that. And so in 2012, you're going to see, see us going after some of these and picking off what would be traditionally very big projects and diving in and thinking about how do we break them down into smaller components. Now, this isn't just a, I go out and put great policy forward. We also need uh, great people to come in and do this. Um, you know, I, I don't know if many of you have met Todd Park, the chief technology officer of, uh, of HHS. Um, he is, uh, he's actually coming uh, at lunch today to do a brown bag to my team on how to run lean startups in government. And so we need more Todds in the world to, to come into government and help you know, understand how to run these very agile development, lean startup type modes where we, we come in and we're putting programs behind that. One program that we've, we've co-launched with Anish Chopra, the chief technology officer in the White House, is the Entrepreneurs in Residence program, thinking about how 
can private sector people take a turn in government? Our first stab at that is actually going around government, finding people that came from the private sector, pulling them out of what they're doing, and putting them into projects like this. We've got one, Frank Bateman, former uh, Social Security Administration CIO, is actually at the FDA right now, running an Entrepreneurs in Residence program there, and thinking about how do we do this. And we want to do this at scale. The other thing is bringing in new young talent into government, or new, new college graduate, not necessarily young talent. Um, and to do that, we launched the Presidential Technology Fellows Program in October. And what that is, is a program by which we, we have people that, um, that have just graduated with a technology degree um, uh, applying to, for, to be in a consideration pool called the Presidential Technology Fellows. Um, and this spring, we'll be able to start hiring people out of that pool. We had a lot of people enter the top of the funnel, and we're excited about what's going what's to uh, be come out the other end of the vetting process for us to consider. And what's great about this is, is uh, once this pool is created, we just point at the pool and hire people. We don't have to run through a normal process. It's, it's, a, uh, it's an offshoot of the Presidential Management Fellows Program, which runs, the same, which runs the same way. And so we're excited about kind of bringing that new talent in and injecting sort of this mentality of we need to do things in a small way that are interoperable and, and can interoperate. When you draw a box around all these components, they deliver a solution. And when laws change, you go in and change one component versus having to change all of it. And it's something that I think in the private sector, you know, software developers and others are embracing uh, kind of across the board. It's, it's the, the way the government needs to move. And we need to bring that startup mentality into government to do it. And I call that future first. All right, to close, um, I want to talk a, just a second about our partnership and how government and private sector works together. When I, when I entitled this speech, Our Moment, I really meant that, that it's our moment to work together. You know, we have the shared interest that when you have a higher performing government, you have a be better business landscape in this, in this country and you, you make your country better because of it. So your call to service from me is really across many things. One is just giving us feedback. You know, we've, we build multiple mechanisms by which we can get feedback. You know, I work with act IAC as an organization and a firm and others to, to get feedback, to, to throw, you know, ideas over the fence and get thoughts to come back. And so please, you know, as you think about your, uh, your involvement in the organization, I would, I would uh, encourage you to continue that involvement because we need to have all players at the table when we're making these policy decisions and, and pushing technology forward. The second one, and that's more of a near term, as I mentioned, is evolving FedRAMP really getting your feedback here and being thoughtful. And when I say evolve FedRAMP, it's also evolve the cloud. And think about where we're going to take the cloud in the future. You know, it, you know, so many people take their notion of the cloud and just take a data center that exists today and sort of just shift it into a different business model, when I think there actually needs to be a technology shift evolved to, um, to capture the full potential of what we could do there, especially in the international aspects of it. So we need your help and the need to think about that. The third is future first and, and the modular stuff I just talked about. And getting your involvement as you engage agencies, getting you, know, you hiring great talent that know how to do this well, that can come in and bring this mentality into government and, and take this forward, um, I'm really excited about. You know, the, the one-two uh, motion of the move little to big and big to little, um, you know, we have a, a motion of consolidation in the shared first. Um, but on the, on the future first, we break things down into components. And I'm also ex I'm very excited in that notion about how we open up opportunities for small businesses and, as well. So if you're a big business, you know, think about subcontracting these agile small businesses. If you're a, a small business, think about how you can play into, into modular contracting and other things to, to, to work your way forward there. Um, and then shared first is, is another area that I, uh, you know, on the consolidation side, on thinking about this, one of the things I would love to promote in shared first is that we start putting boilerplate language into procurements that allow, uh, allow sharing. So it, in many organizations, if I, if I see you're getting a better price on computers than I am, I, I try to jump on your procurement. That's not allowed through agency policy and other, other rules. And so, and so connecting the dots on that will require that we put forward, working with the FAR Council and evolving this, that we do that. But I also want to be respectful if you're bidding on a contract that you go in eyes wide open knowing that, um, that you know, this contract may be expanded, which is a great thing you know, if you, you do it. But you should have that, you should know that going in versus, uh, versus have it be shared after. And so 
thinking about how do we architect that, I'm sure many of you work with acquisition community and, and uh, have your own professionals there. So we, we need a collaboration and a dialogue happening to evolve this. This won't be something that just sort of happens. We'll, 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 we'll make this a, 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 good, uh, a good thing moving forward. And so with that, I, we're going to take some questions, but I first want to thank you for uh, taking the time, as I mentioned, with the busy holiday section. And uh, I and, uh, hope you have a great holiday as well for everyone. So thank you very much. Jim Pray, we want to thank uh, Steve for first taking the time to come and talk to us, and, and secondly about being transparent about his vision of what government and IT can do for government, how we can improve things, and we can do more with less. <laughs> Everybody, yes. <answer. laughs> well, we have time for a few questions, so uh, we can open up. Please go to the mics so everybody can hear. I think we'll start here on the right side of the room. Uh, Stephen, thank you very much. Uh, Excellent roadmap. Uh, my name is John Weiler. I'm with the IT Acquisition Advisory Council. Hi. I participated in a half-day seminar put on by Potomac Institute and Battelle about innovation and the barriers to innovation. It was quite an eye-opener. And they mentioned that the government needs to re-embrace public-private partnerships and formal mechanisms for small businesses and innovators to come back in. That innovation, you know, the acquisition bureaucracy is an impediment to small business. They can't afford the timelines and and partnering has not always been effective in the past. Do you have any ideas about re-embracing public-private partnerships and other transaction uh, authorities as a way for small innovators to come in? This is, you know, I'm not an acquisition professional, and you should talk to Mary up here about <laughs> the broadest scope of this, and nor, nor am I a lawyer to know any of the, the details of this, but I'm probably most excited about kind of this, the, what's happening at the mission level. What you tend to, tend to see, I think, in the, uh, in the deployment of technology in government is that even though you, know, you have on the commodity side sort of these smaller installations and implementations of technology, they tend to be from big providers. Um, and, and then you have the motion of in the mission side, you sign up kind of the big provider to come in and sort of do the end-to-end -end mission work across multiple years or use the people that you've already contracted with. I think breaking those things down and creating opportunity on the small business side is very, very important and, and something that we want to promote. I, you know, at the FCC, when we did the website there, um, we did it all through 8A contracts and, and broke it down into these small, small guys to come in. Now, I do agree that we need to think about, we need to think about a couple things. One is, how do we, uh, how do we streamline the process and, and kind of clarify uh, the, the engagement of small business with the government? I know Mary and the team at GSA is working on that a lot, and that's, that's very much a priority, as, as well as a priority of the Small Business Administration and others to think about. Um, and then the other one is thinking about how do we, how do we um, you know, create the right kinds of opportunities for people to, to come in, and I think that's where the, the, the sort of future first approach and breaking these things down helps us. Now, my problem with the FCC is all the 8As that I hired through the work they did, they, they hired so many people they weren't 8As anymore. <laughs> they, they weren't small businesses. So that's not a bad thing. That's not it's, a bad a, thing. it's a good thing. Well, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Start over here. Yes, sir. Uh, Robert Damaschek from Binary Group, also an IAC member. Um, it seems like in, in getting to a number of the initiatives that you're talking about, there's See, there's a lack of emphasis on, on getting to a common semantics, right? Because we, we haven't emphasized how do we standardize in sharing, information sharing about the life cycle itself, about the investment life cycle from mission needs through uh, do we have ready resources to, you know, how it's actually executed to, you know, the assessment of it. And uh, you, know, you see a little bit of that in, like, holistic approach to architecture. You don't see it in NEEM or other efforts. You know, it's, it's, it's focused on domains and, and other. So uh, how do you think we'll get there? Do, do you feel your, um, your office can place a greater emphasis? And, you know, we want to get more eyes on target, you know, and really get greater sharing, you know, and, and all. How, how do you think we can actually get there, and will you place more of an emphasis on getting common semantics? Uh, definitely so. Um, uh, I don't think Scott Bernard is in the <laughs> audience here today. He, he is our chief architect, and he, he can attest that over the course of his time at, at, in the Office of Electronic Government, 
uh, the word enterprise architecture hasn't been mentioned more than coming out of my mouth. And, and thinking about how do we break this down, just yesterday he presented to me a common approach to architecture where we're actually breaking down each of the major categories of work that happens across the federal portfolio and defining for those each, um, each uh, subsection in a way that creates a common, uh, a common way of talking about it and, and a common approach. Um, that, I think, went out today for, for comment from the CIO community and will be put out for public comment uh, very soon. And so we are going to create, and what, what you'll end up seeing is that, that approach and that, that language actually gets pulled into things like the IT dashboard. And so we can look across government and start to say, what are, what are the opportunities on the commodity side or on different ways we're doing things? And I think as we look for opportunities to do that level of sharing and standardization, we also have to seize on inflection points like mobile and other things to, to start to do more kind of common things. And I, and we'll, I think we'll, we'll get there through this effort. Thank so thank you. Hi, uh, Jason Bloomberg with ZapThink. It's good to see you again. It's yeah, been a nice while. to see you. Long time. Yeah, well, ZapThink is now part of Dovell, so we're a government contractor now. And, and what I find most exciting about what you're talking about is uh, uh, focusing on changing the way we as a community think about technology. So it's not just a tactical shift, but it's really a, a strategic shift. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, shifting the way we uh, think about how the cloud and how the cloud, you, know, so you mentioned the technology shift, it's more than just a big data center. It's, uh, it involves new ways of thinking about technology. And of course, future first, moving to agile, I mean, agile and U.S. federal government in the same sentence is an is a entirely new concept <laughs> and, and will require fundamentally new ways of thinking about procurement and about, uh, uh, you know, technology deployments. Uh, and so there's a whole new ways of thinking. And then uh, how we can help, you, you mentioned evangelism, and that's sort of where I fit in. So can you be more specific? How can we help you evangelize these shifts in technology thinking? I think that, thanks for the question. It's, I think I was... Uh, I think I was at the conference when ZapThink was launched for the first time. So that was a, that was a, while, a while, like a while, decade or more ago, ago right? <laughs> um, uh, you know, on the evangelism side, I think we, you know, one is, is you know, don't take technology for granted in, in your way of communicating and, and getting the basics out there. You know, when I sit down with Congress people, I talk about the art of the possible and what can be done. And, and I, I often bring that photograph to say, you know, it, it's most compelling when they, when they hear you know, that a, that a, a, a warfighter in the center, center of some desert somewhere in the world can't get connected to their family, or we can build that connection through technology, or that veterans' claims can be, uh, you know, VA claims can be, the backlog there can be alleviated through technology, or we can do this or that. And what was amazing is this is my first time in, in OMB, and sitting through the, the fiscal year 13 sort of budget process, I, I got a lot, you know, I got, got to see sort of the umbrella across the government of, of all the requests that were coming in, how we're sort of managing all this. And, you know, technology isn't, uh, isn't really a solution for anything in government, but it's part of the solution to almost everything. And so making sure that people understand that technology's role in it. Now, tactically, you know, that's kind of high-minded on the, on the level. Tactically, what to do, I think, you know, getting out and meeting, you know, with you know, make it local, talk to your Congress people, get local government and state to put pressure on the federal government to just perform in a better way, um, you know, demo and, and show the art of the possible, you know, there. I think, I think things like the Consumer Electronics Association did this thing called CES on the Hill that was very well attended. I don't know if any of you went. It was, you couldn't even walk through the crowd. There were so many people in it in the Eastern Market. I think things like that where we showcase, and I know act IAC just recently has been doing some of this uh, up on the hill, and I'm, I'm encouraged by that, and I think we just need to keep, keep doing, it, um, doing it. There will be some natural pressure to move, I think, as, as we get you know, younger and younger people elected and they sort of come in, they're just going to expect more kind of coming into government, um, and as we th show the promise of what technology can do from a hands-on perspective, I think we'll get part of the way there. It's, a, it's, it's culture. It's the hardest thing to change, yeah, but it's, uh, it's something I think that is an essential piece to, to, to kind of moving the needle on the way government does stuff. So. Very good. Well, we're here to help, so I'm glad you're Great. Uh, talking to communities like this. Excellent. Thank you. you another question over here? Good morning, Stephen. My name is Michael Fox. I'm head of uh, Carpathia Government Solutions. We're a hosting provider. Hi. Um, my question's a little loaded, but um, <laughs> so I'll preface it. Um, uh, it's a two-part. One, the question, then the reason I'm asking. In hindsight, what is the government going to do as far as following the processes and compliance for rolling out FedRAMP 
that they, uh, with hindsight of what they did under the GSA infrastructure as a service and now email as a service, BPA, yep. um, obviously getting to the compliance factor of cloud. What are, you, what are you going to do differently in this process to, one, speed it up, and two, get to a baseline? Um, I noticed in your presentation, so part two, is that it's a progressive, evolving process. One of the challenges we have in industry is getting to the baseline quick enough yep. and then doing the evolution and adjustments. Yep. So my question is, what are we going to do differently in hindsight, having gone through that process? Uh, I have right here sitting in the front row. <laughs>